Next time he comes over, I've still got some pepperoni for him. I don't know what she gets. There's six minutes till. So now, what's that magnolia in the Albany virtual tour? Yeah, it's going to read anything that's going to be yeah. tour. I don't know. Hickory Senior Living. Uh, that's, that may be promoting, a, uh, oh, that's a that's an assisted living home. It's magnolia? Yeah. There's one I go past in each of that big, like, warehouse. Oh, man, I'm fine. Yeah, and it looks amazing. It looks well, popular. Last year in April, we had a virtual, our historical society was going to be meeting there on site till COVID messed that up. Neighborhood. Oh, back up that, back up one. What building is that? The estate at New Albany virtual tour, the estate at New Albany. I don't know where that is. Huh. Oh my god. Hey guys, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to show you around the state virtually. So this is gonna give you a good idea of what it's like to actually take a tour if you were here in person. All right, so once your ceremony has ended, your guests are gonna follow that pathway back around and they're gonna enter in here. Oh, it's, it's a wedding venue. Get into your house. It's a what? It's like a wedding venue. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. yeah, forget that. Henryville Tornado. So let's search again. We use the last bullets. History of New Albany. That's right, Jim. Oh boy. Well, see, so anything will come up. That's cool. And when you go into that, look, that has 17 videos. So somebody is uploading videos uh, under that same topic. Oh, that's going to be the new city hall right there, Teresa. Are they saving that time at all? I do not know that. I don't think so. Uh, what would they do with it? I do not know that. See, so. Oh, gosh, there's a lot of New Albany there. I'm wrong with that. So see, you can have all kinds of fun. Uh, YouTube is fun. Downtown New Albany, 1969. Wow, that would be so interesting. So that's probably just somebody that had some footage. Because anybody can upload a YouTube. Yeah, there was the golf station. I'm not sure. It's somebody's home. Yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. Are you the 
on no, the nothing on the phone yet. And it's time right now. English. Ooh, you won't get much on English yeah. yet. Uh, there's video of English. You don't know who's uploaded what. See, you don't uh, know what people have uploaded and what. Oh you my know. gosh. There's Sycamore Springs and two views of English. Hello, Jeremy. I, I guess I'll say it since my granddad's not on yet. Okay, Victor one, one, one second, please. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Is Michael there? He, he, Michael Pale hasn't joined yet, so I, I, I'll say Victor Meganitti. Oh, okay. Michael <laughs> Pale. Ah, there we go. Yeah, uh, I, I just uh, finished the the weekly family Zoom meeting, and he was not on that, but I hear oh. I hear that he uh, is hopefully going to join us for this one. Um, and let me see here. I forget how I have this set up. Give me, oh, good. Bob, Bob Robert Mason is joining. Hello. Hello, Bob. Hello. And Bob Roberts. Hello. 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 Bob Roberts, uh, before I forget, did you tell me that you and Curdy Benham were first cousins? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, well, I, I, I just, I finished my weekly family Zoom meeting and no one on it thought that that was the case. Sarah, Sarah Combs, uh, Paula Ferguson, John Flanagan, um, and Bobby Jane, Batman, Tillery, none of them thought that 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 could figure out that connection. So I can report back that uh, I knew something they didn't. How are you getting along? I'm doing fine. They're not doing a very good job of filming. They're just standing in one spot. Yeah. Move around. I'm not hearing Bob hardly at all. You can't hear me. It, it it is it, your your audio is rather faint, Bob Roberts. Okay. That, you know. That that improved it. You know, I, well, I got a little closer to my. Uh, That's better. That's okay. better. Okay, I was just too far away, I guess. Yeah. By the way, my, my daughter is showing on YouTube a video of English Indiana before the buildings came down. That's on YouTube. I didn't know that. She was just now finding it. There's the English market. Have you ever seen any of that, Bob? Are, are you going to? No, I'm not getting any of it. Okay, it's no, very no, no, no. interesting. You just searched English Indiana. Uh, Teresa said all she did was search English Indiana on YouTube. Yeah, I I think it, it, if it's what I'm thinking of, and it could be something different, but the the historical society, the Crawford County Historical Society, uh, has posted that there's one video that that my granddad Mike shot. It was around 1990, I want to say. Um, and that and that's the same uh, YouTube channel, the Historical Society's YouTube channel, where this monthly video of uh, you guys and your shenanigans gets posted for people to see. So I'm I'm thinking it's probably uh, from the Historical Society's postings. Yeah, the date is August of 1990. Is did you see uh, Martha Jane Flanagan? Oh, I see the old linotype machine. They're inside the print shop yeah. right now. Yep. Oh boy. And and speaking of um, videoing, um, Tim Ede 
had said that he was going to try to join us today. Um, he's of a, a slightly different or one generation removed, I think, um, from from you all, but he grew up in English. And um, he, he's been uh, watching these monthly videos of yours and um, then kind of adding things and asking questions and, it, by messaging me. And so I asked him if he'd like to, to join one of these times and maybe kind of ask you guys some, some questions. Um, so we'll see if he, if he is able to make it. Um, I, and I, I, I do remember Tim, sure. His dad was Kenneth Eads, a, a minister in English. And I remember Tim. Yeah, the video now is showing details of the linotype machine and uh, Teresa, uh, your uncle Bob, Bob McGinnity, ran a linotype machine for probably 35 or 40 years. And, my, and uh, Jeremy, my brother Bob, I've mentioned this before, I think, was really, really happy when he called Mike Flanagan, your granddad, in when he lived near Washington in D, uh, DC. And Mike just happened to mention that there was a line type operator opening that he noticed in at Fort Knox, Kentucky, which is only about 30 miles from where he lives. So he applied, got the job and stayed there till he, he stayed there about 20 years till he retired about uh, 20 years ago. How, how about that? That's neat. 20 years. and. That, that looks like, so we've got John Flanagan, we've got Della, and we've got Tim Eat, I think, joining us now. Super. I definitely don't need to be talking this hour. <laughs> Except I'll, I'll say hi to my granddad if he, if he ends up joining. He, sh he should be joining yeah. us. Tim's connecting to audio. Hi, Dylan. John. Bob. Can you hear us, Della? No. Looks like she might be, because uh, she connects on her iPad, so looks like she might be uh, trying to get the sound. There we go. Maybe she means to do like I did and move it a little closer. Says Della's connecting to audio. Can you hear us now, Della? I'm here now. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right, Della. How about this? Well, I'm clear. I'm sorry, Vic. This is Vic. Good seeing you, Della. Nice to see you, Vic. Yeah. How you doing? Have you survived well, the winter and the pandemic? And absolutely, yeah. Have you got your shots, Della? Yes, sir. Okay, good for you. Have you? Oh yes, yes. So we could, uh, Gordon and I could come visit you. Absolutely. Where is I Gordon? Is he joining us? Oh, Hi, Bob. Hi. Yes, I, I hope everyone has those shots that. Uh... Oh, oh, Gor Gordon did message me here. Join the meeting. Okay, T Tim, I think uh, is joining by phone for audio because it's not uh, letting him connect through the through the video. Can you hear us, Tim? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, indeed. I'm, I, I'm going to, uh, this is Jeremy. I'm going to be quiet then and uh, let, let you guys talk yeah. some. And I'm going to communicate with Gordon to, to help him uh, join here. He's trying to join and having trouble. So I'm, I'm going to be quiet. But I, I was telling uh, before Della joined, um, I think, and, and Uncle John, that Tim Ede is uh, on just audio only, and Vic McGinnity said that he remembers uh, Tim and Tim's father, um, but um, Tim, Tim grew up in English um, a few years after you guys and has been watching 
these videos of you each month and has communicated with me about some of his memories and some of your memories. And so I invited him to, to join today and thought that uh, uh, you guys can sort of uh, share and, and reminisce and learn from each other about your respective uh, experiences. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute and uh, get Gordon on here and hopefully my granddad, Michael, will be joining um, shortly. Probably in English today that it's misting rain. It's rained about an inch and a half. And uh, it's just green up the grass. That I've had my grass mowed already twice this year. And yesterday, uh, I had a couple of hummingbirds come into my feet. That's the first this year. Really? That's exciting. <laughs> I haven't oh, seen yes. I love to watch them. Last year, I had an albino come in. And uh, another thing, there was a, a red-headed, red-breasted woodpecker. Uh, and it's not the big redpecker, but the, it's about half that size. But he was feeding on that uh, hummingbird feeder. He'd get upside down. And he lasted about two weeks. And uh, I, never saw, I never saw him anymore. I have a picture of him. There's Bob. Hi, Bob. Hello. Hi, Bob. He's being quiet. He hadn't said he hadn't said a word all morning. <laughs> Speak up, Bob. I don't know whether you all knew Carolyn Lane or not. That was Marcus Lane's daughter that she passed away this last week. I just heard that yesterday. Greg Greg Roberts called me and we chatted a while and he told me that yesterday that Carolyn Lane had passed away. Yeah, her her, uh, her mother was my first cousin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Who was who was Carolyn Lane? I don't remember. Uh, Mar uh, Marcus Lane's daughter. She was probably about four or five or six grades behind us, Della. Yeah, she was. I think seventy-seven. She graduated in 61. Oh, 61. Okay. Oh, she was, was she was in Judy's, Judy's class. Okay. I, I guess I didn't know her. I remember the name, but I, I don't remember her. Uh, Vic was Tim Eads. His father was a minister in English, right? Yeah, that's Kelly Eads. It's Christian church. Yeah. Which father. church? Which church? Christian church. That's English what I Christian. That and was what? probably before it got moved to Marengo and the name changed. That, that was, I think, the oldest Christian church in the United States. I believe it went back to maybe uh, uh, about the time that uh, Indiana became a state. What year? The it? original... The original church building used to be a cabin that was on the uh, Dog Creek there. Uh, I'm sorry, off of Brownstown Road. And so that was the original church. And the building was down off of 37 and uh, Court Street. Does that ring a bell or anything? They brought it up, uh, put a basement under it and raised the church back in the 30s or 40s, I think, is what I'm told. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, the, you Does that help you, Bella? Well, was that the, the church that was flooded? During the... Uh, what it year? was definitely flooded. Bella, what did you ask? <laughs> Hey, John. Hi, John. Hello, John. Hello, hello. How's your volcano? It's still oozing, but it's not very exciting yet. <laughs> still attracting the tourists. So someone had asked had asked uh, Tim if if that was the church that flooded. Uh, yes. Yeah, it was down in the low area. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but the on, Presbyterian Church. It was on Court Street between uh, 
I guess, second and third street. Presbyterian down on uh, down on the road that went to uh, maybe East Fifth Street. Uh, that one was always in the floods. That's beside the old uh, Presbyterian. Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, those those two. That one definitely did. Now the Christian Church flooded back before. Bob, do you know if that was the thirties or the forties when they raised that? Bobby Smith used to talk to me about it. It was, uh, it was probably in the twenties because I was the same. I started going there when I was. Dad would take me when I was three or four years old, and that was getting into the late twenties, and the church was built uh -huh. in. Okay, so that's so that's uh, Peltzabella. You guys were just youngsters then. Oh, yeah. Well, we, you know, they had a, a little deal that uh, was involved in the Christian church that uh, the uh, Marengo congregation had a falling out. And uh, their members of the Christian church came to English. And uh, the English congregation had been going down and down and down. And when the flood came along and flooded it out, and uh, they were going to give them money for that and everything. And uh, the uh, Marengo congregation outnumbered the English congregation. And uh, they had the church with all the monies they got out of it and the parsonage and the whole works moved over closer to Marengo than it was English. So I don't know whether you'd call that stealing a church or what. <laughs> One of the idiosyncrasies of dem of democratic action. <laughs> okay, now well, when English, when English, uh, you're talking mo modern day here. I can't tell. The thing is, my screen is not telling me when I can talk, when I can't. So if I interrupt someone, please just shut me up and move on. But when the English Church, uh, when they did that, and moved up to Hill um, Hillview is the name of it. Now that's been what. 30 years ago now, I assume? Probably. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so. One thing too, they had they had two lots up in the new town. And so yeah. uh, the yeah. new church over there sold those up, I think, along with the parsonage and the money they got out of the church or whatever they had, which was quite a bit. I know Dad and Mom never went up to Hillview because it wasn't built at that point, and they came here in 1994 and to New Hampshire. So, Tim, you you live in New Hampshire. I live in New Hampshire. Been here for 34 years this July. So, and they haven't kicked me out yet. Uh, Tim. <laughs> A little comment that on New Hampshire. Vic, Vic, I'm sorry, what were you asking me? Vic McGinnity gonna, was going to ask a question, but he's uh, <clears throat> he's muted now. We don't see you or hear you now, Vic. We'll, we'll wait for, for him to come back. I, I was able to I'll, rename I'll you. Comment. I'll just comment that Tim and I are farthest apart. Well, if that's, if that's oh. John Flanagan, yes. I'd rather be in uh, Hawaii than I would in the cold. Although we've been having Hawaii, Hawaii temperatures here the last couple of days. And I mean, this is unusual for us to have anything in the 70s around Boston at this time of year. So, you know, so we're competing with you right now. Oh, very good. <laughs> Keep it up. Okay, I did. Okay. Okay, Vic, Vic is back. Vic has the floor. Okay, um, this is mainly for Tim, but I work at our fire museum every Friday, and we have one of the oldest fire engines in the United States, 1756 from Portsmouth, Portsmouth New Hampshire. It was oh, you've got it. It was found <laughs> in a barn in 1960 
one of those barn finds, an old barn in New Hampshire. Whoever found it realized its importance and refurbished it, got it ready to go again. It's a hand pumper. And we had it working in an, uh, out of our museum building about four years ago. And it pumps water when, when you're pumping the handles. It pumps water about 50, 60 feet probably. Better than the old bucket brigades, but that's one of our real treasures at our fire museum. Sure. Wow. Appreciate the fire, that. Museum, the fire museum is in is on Spring Street in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Well, that's we have I one believe, at, at Middleton. I yeah. believe John John Flanagan had some uh, pictures of a fire that. Uh, Burned up English probably in the twenties. Oh. A picture, a picture of the monument shop there and everything, and oh. that was done by the fire plugs. That uh, they had the hose that was over on a cart in the mill, and they'd wheel it to the fire plugs, and that they okay. didn't have any uh, any other thing except uh, the town pressure. They didn't have any trucks. Sure, sure. you have the I pictures of that, I've John. The, I think I've got those pictures on my smug mug side. Yeah. Yes, I've so. Yeah. So, Tim, you can go to my Smug Mug site and look at those. It's the address is J.M. Flanagan with no spaces dot smug mug dot com. Oh, yeah, it had a picture of my father. And you do? They're in the East Reach Brothers and one in East Reach Brothers. But, uh... Did you say that was John Flanagan? Yeah, John, John Flanagan had those pictures. But uh, remember, you came through with, years ago with a, a lot of uh, pictures, John, that uh, you had even had part of your, oh, vacation, your vacation up in Alaska on it. Do you remember that? Right. And uh, they had, had an awfully lot of good, good pictures on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sharing my screen now. This won't... I, well, I don't know, Tim, if you can click see. on the on the <laughs> old beat up house that, that says history. History. OK, I'm, I'm sharing Uncle John's smug mug site. So it's J as in John. J M. Okay. J M Flanagan, F-L-A-N-I-G-A-N dot smug, S-M-U-G, mug, M-U-G all together, smug mug dot com. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'll definitely, and if I don't have this all uh, down, I'll get a hold of you, Jeremy, through Facebook, and hopefully then I can get the whole thing together. But I think I got it this time. I don't want to, like I say, if I'm on here, I don't want to take over your conversations. I want you all to feel comfortable with me because I don't know a lot of you. Uh, I do know Bob Roberts, and I know uh, Mark. I really never knew Vic. I knew about him, though. <laughs> yeah. So just, uh, uh, and of course, I knew Mark and James Flanagan. The Flanagan boys, I tell you something, I feel like I grew up with you because guess who she talked about? <laughs> ha, 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 ha. That, it was always good. You know Martha Jane. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Does anyone know what happened to the Presbyterian Church's stained glass windows? I do, I do. Okay. Who said if you I go do? to Leavenworth, if you go to Leavenworth, they've been placed in, as I understand it, they've been placed in a building that has been used as a, uh, uh, a senior activity center or a uh, not. I won't say nursing home because it's not that. It's, a, it's for adults that need assistance, as I understand it. Is that what, am I correct, Vic? That's not the information I have. The information what I do you have, have, Jack Robinson, many of you remember Jack. He told me that those windows were going in the church out at Sycamore Springs. And now they're in there now, and I'm pretty sure that those are the Presbyterian Church stained glass windows in that church. Yeah, they're stained okay, glass. Okay, that was the, yes. They're beautiful because there were pictures in them. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, they were. Okay, well, like I say, that's, 
that was the last I'd heard. And so, so it sounds like where, what you said is much better. <laughs> I think that's correct. I wouldn't bet on it, but I think that's correct. Well, I wonder if there's any way to identify them. If we, his, his two sisters is running it now, and I could probably ask them. I would imagine Mercedes yeah, they would know. Uh, would I'll probably know. Yeah, and everything. And they're they're open now. And yeah, stuff. they've added they've added a lot of things to there. That uh, that that Sycamore Springs has always been amazing to me. That everything is free when you go in there. And I think, isn't camping still free, Bob? I believe it is and stuff. Uh, they, have, uh, they, have, they have to, uh, it takes about a year to get your trailer in there though, I think. Oh, they, okay, there's a waiting really, list. They really yeah. have a lot of them because it probably is free. Yeah. And the campgrounds and the toilets out there and cut wood for their fires and the whole That's right. Yep. All they have to do is probably Furnish their food. That's about it. Yeah, it'd be it'd be nice if they could have that uh, alumni deal down there and uh, where you McGinnity boys used to have it. Yeah, yeah. But I don't I don't think we'll probably have any more at the school. I wonder. It, you know, it was scheduled last year for the community building up yes. up in uh, the new, up in New English. Yeah. I wonder. We're going to try to do that again coming up maybe next year. I don't know. It better hurry. Yeah. <laughs> how how um how many folks would you say would would attend at this point? <coughs> I'm just trying to get an idea. Of... 160 or so, wasn't they the last one? No, we had? It was it was pushing 200 as I remember them announcing. That was 19. And Clayton East would always take gobs of food over to the, over to a, a housing unit, I think is what he did. So a lot of people spent time talking instead of eating, I think. <laughs> yeah, really. That's the last time I saw Vic as well as I also saw Bob Roberts there. That's okay. been what, probably three years ago. Mm -hmm. And the good news about Bob and me is that the oldest alumni there get to go through the lunch line first, the meal line first. <laughs> That's for several years. Uh, yeah. Our, our table's the oldest one. Yeah, That's, that's right. It, uh, it goes back. I think Max, Maxine Staniford is the oldest living uh, deal unless... You know, Angela had an aunt that lived over in Ohio, and she was 105 years old. Whoa. I believe that she graduated maybe in 31 or 32, and that was at the last alumni meeting we had. Oh. Have I missed so something? We're just kids. Where are Gordon and Mike? Uh, Gordon is having trouble joining. I, I, I've been, we've been... Uh, communicating with each other and for some reason he's um, he's not able to to connect so I'm still holding out hope and and Mike I I don't know he he's at the uh, mercy of uh, my aunt who he lives with so um, he's uh, he wasn't on the the family zoom we, we do a, a weekly family zoom and he wasn't on that but I heard that he was hopefully going to be on this so um, I, like I said, I'm still holding out hope, um, but did, uh, oh, Uncle John, so Bob Roberts did confirm that Curdy Benham and he are first cousins, correct? Right. Really? Okay. It's through the, through the Benhams. Did not but, know uh, my mother yeah. was a Benham hmm. and his father, the brothers and sisters, they were all oh. four. Four girl, four girls, and uh, four boys in that. Hmm. Uh, that Julius Benham was my grandfather, and uh, his father was killed uh, eventually in a sawmill accident and left his mother with uh, eight children, seven girls and one boy. And not only that, but uh, her 
father was killed in the Civil War when she, I think, maybe five or six years old. Hmm. But she raised a family of eight and lived to be about, I don't know, up in her, way up in her 90s. And she, when she was in her 90s, she was working at a restaurant down in English. I believe it was Claude Brown's washing dishes. Hmm. Do, and, do, you re, do you remember her, Bob? Oh, very well. Do you? She used to babysit with us. Okay. She she keep me straight. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one of one of her daughters was little Maddie Moore, and that's the one that drove the Model T that uh, Della was talking about to Jack Turner. That right. was one of her daughters. Uh, Maddie Bob, and Maddie. This is a off the subject, but I want to ask while I'm thinking about it. Do you remember a lady who used to drive an electric car? I remember being in the Eastridge garage one time when she drove an electric car in there. Uh, Julia, Julia Longus had one bill. It was just, it, it was kind of a, well, my brother had it and had a motorcycle. Oh, this uh, one. Engine in it. it was Julia. He got killed in a car accident and Julia, Julian got it and fixed it up where it operated off, off of batteries. Now, I don't no, know whether Daisy this maybe. This wasn't the homemade one. This, this was a regular production model. No, I, remember there was I can't high, remember that job. Big high seat. And I was just a little kid fooling around. I think I may have been patching a bicycle tire or something. And she drove that in and it was quiet. So I made a comment and whoever it was talking to me pointed out that was an electric car so that's I haven't had any other reference to it I don't know anybody else who would remember it who was it a woman that drove the electric car who it was it was an old lady of course I was like five so she might have been as much as 30. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we had it back then Well, the car, the yeah, interesting. cars were electric, right? Before they converted them to gasoline. You want to call her? Do you all remember Barnett Store, north of English? I live just south of that. And I remember before electricity, they had some kind of a power system. I don't know what it was. Wasn't that town operated? I'm sorry. There used to be a uh, deal of be was part of the old mill. They had the generator that uh, operated the town, and I think they mm -hmm. stuff they quit running at about eleven o'clock every night. They'd cut it down. There was wasn't any electricity then, mm -hmm. but uh, the machinery and stuff was back next to the creek on part of the old mill building. It's right back there, back of Buggy Loan's store, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. uh, Bob Roberts, what's in that old mill building? Do you know? No. No, that the, the state did have a thing on the back of it there, but they quit having it. They needed facilities, and there wasn't any facility in that. Yeah. Stuff. But it is still standing, right? The mill. Yes, I wonder when that was built. I remember going there as a child. Oh, yeah, they used to grind wheat and they uh, had flour and uh, cornmeal. Yeah. And they sold. Uh, we used to go back and uh, unload a boxcar, would come in there with animal feed. It's 100 pound bags. And uh, Bud Brown and I uh, used to unload it. When you took it in, you had to stack yeah, one on top of the other. And both of us had to handle that deal there. We we got 50 cents a piece for unloading it. Well. <laughs> what I remember is, you know, when uh, my parents would take me to the mill, my dad bought some kind of feed and they started putting it in printed sacks. And my mother made my clothes out of those printed sacks. 
Uh, yep. And so my parents would take me to the mill as a child and let me pick out the printed sacks that I wanted my clothes made out of. <laughs> yes, there were a lot of flour mill dresses. That was the depression. That was the way to go. <clears throat> now, the Buggy Loan Store, everybody remembers Buggy, I think. Did they live in that building in the back of it, Jack and Ted and Buggy? Yes. I don't know. They did. Must have been pretty crowded, wasn't they it? They did when I was a kid. Well, you know, for it a while they lived in that house. They lived in that house before you crossed the creek. It was right behind the, the uh, filling station. Had the oh, filling yeah. station in the creek, and there was a house there and stuff. Yeah. I think Buggy, that's probably and Jack and Ted lived there and then when Buggy died that Jack and Ted lived in the back of the store. Okay. Huh. Ted always went down to near Evansville to teach, I know. Yep. I think Boonville's where he taught school. Yeah. That's right. Couldn't think of the name of it. Yeah. Boonville is where Arnie Vogel song last lived, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's right. Yeah. He died? What? Yeah, no, he, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, he had Alzheimer's and he told me he was taking pills and says, Well, uh, you go over in Evansville. And he said, I haven't got lost going home yet. That's the last time I saw Arnie. He came up to my house with uh, the Flanagans and stuff, the Mike and uh, all of them, and uh, visited with him a little while. That, uh, he was quite some Arnie. Yes, he was. <laughs> he, he and Jake Xer used to sumo wrestle. <laughs> Bob, we were we were at a uh, varsity e club picnic one time. Varsity e club, and uh, and so we had some beer there, and it had a flat top on it, and I had what was called a church key. So I punched a hole on the side at the top and then a bigger hole at the lip where you'd have to drink out of it. And every time he'd take a drink, he'd have a bunch running down his chin on his shirt. <laughs> and after about three beers, I kept punching that. His whole shirt was wet. And, and I finally told him, he said, I'm going to get even with you, Vic. You shouldn't have done that. But, but I still laugh about that. That was funny. <laughs> Oh, he put away a lot of Budweiser. Yeah. You know, when Arnie was in, the, I guess, the Air Corps, he was over in uh, Asia someplace. Well, that's why I'm and, uh, I used to uh, get the Courier Journal Sunday paper, and I would wrap up the sports section and send it to Arnie oh. every Sunday. So he called me when he came back to the States and he was captain and I think, and he said, Bob, I have a, a, a package come in. said, it's about three foot square and about an inch thick. He said, it's from Captain Arnold Vogel's song to Captain. <laughs> and said, uh, uh, that belongs to you. I don't want it to go to Grantsburg. So Carolyn Lane was working there at the time and it came in. I said, I think that belongs to me. It already said did. So she said, let's just tear it open. So it did. And there it was. It was a picture of me nude and on a bear rug with my hands <laughs> over my private smoking a cigar. <laughs> so that that picture is behind my bar in the basement. How about that? Oh <laughs> Okay, last last time we got together, one of the questions was who can name as many marshals in English? And I, I got a few in my head. Bob, you probably got some too. Well, you all go ahead and then if I can think of anything, I'll fill in after you get filtered. Well, Muck Brown was a marshal, wasn't he? No, I don't think so. Oh, well, maybe he I'm was wrong a boot, on that. he was a bootlegger most of the time. Oh, okay, a bootlegger, huh? Yeah, he lived uh, in that little house behind Bunk's store. There was a barn yeah. in between there, and he he was facing Court Street. 
and when the flood would come up, he would get a newspaper and light a cigar, and he was like a cork. He would float <laughs> around in his yard. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he and some other guy about the same size of his used to have a foot race as one of the holidays from the railroad track to Fifth Street. And uh, they didn't set any records or anything. <laughs> but uh, I've heard the old people tell me about it. And they probably both weighed about 400 pounds. <laughs> Well, was Julian Longus a marshal at one time? No. He wasn't. The first one I remember, and John probably does too, was Cad Funk. Cad Funk, right. And uh, young the liquor store down there across from Leo Land's store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one I remember after that was uh, Emmett Johnson. Yeah, Cad, Cad Funk's the only one I remember. Yeah, he, he came after him. How about Craig Froman? Yeah, Craig Craig was there. He was after the war. Okay. And stuff. I thought that, uh, there was uh, uh, Earl Hughes was uh, marshal for a while. He used to chase us boys. That uh, they put that curfew out, and we had to be <laughs> off the streets. But we never did go. But uh, <laughs> he, would, he would run us down. And then Roy Bell Longus. Roy Bell. He, yeah. he was, he was uh, Marshall. Yeah. And uh, Jackie and Lowell. Oh, I forgot about him. And Jackie and Lowell. And then there was uh, uh, Shelby Bowman. It's, you know, Basid Bowman was the old man's name. He had two sons, Cheryl and uh, Hansel. But he was, hey. he was, he, he liked to play poker quite a bit. Yeah. Up, what was the motive for that curfew? I remember the siren going off at night. Yeah. Signaling that everybody's supposed to be home in bed. But yeah. do you know I why was, it was instituted? I was probably, they took me out of the fourth grade and we had to go up, and up here before the grand jury. Oh. And stuff. And they, uh, your uh, grandfather printed a a lot of things in that paper that just wasn't exactly true. It got people to agree, agree with and stuff and they had in the paper, and this was headlines, Black Legion terrorizes English. Oh, wow. And they said we had, we had a Robin Hood gang and stuff. And uh, the, uh, we asked the Hammond brothers if we could cut down trees. We well, can imagine how big I was if I was in the fourth grade. <laughs> we finally got it built, and there's a guy named Richard Wakefield, and Bob Austin had a gang, and he told Bob about it, and they went out and tore down our uh, thing that we'd worked all summer at. So Alan Maddox was on the deal, and he met uh, Richard coming down the street, and he punched him in the nose. <laughs> it was a bleeder. So he went home, and his grandfather or his grandmother just whipped hell out of him. And took him around to Pooch Gobbles and got his nose packed and tore off his shirt and said, this is what those boys did to him. Oh, oh. And so it got there and it had been a circus in town. And, uh, so it was printed in the paper and they had buried somebody hypnotized and buried alive. Well, this guy said he'd come down to the park and we had some guy buried with just his head sticking out <laughs> and stuff. And this was printed in the paper. <laughs> they didn't say who said them or anything. So somebody came up there and says, you boys have to go to Courthouse Hill in front of the grand jury. So we walked up, and I was in the fourth grade, to the courthouse. And they had us back in the room, and so happened that Mae Moss, which was Bud Joe Eastridge's grandmother, she was on there, and we practically raised Bud Joe. We took him with us everywhere we went. And... Uh, Cucklebur Eastridge, the old attorney, both of those were on the grand jury. And they knew what we might fight a little bit and throw rocks at each other, but we didn't do that stuff. So if it hadn't been for those two people, they would have sent about eight or 10 of us to the farm school. Oh, Instead, they created, they'd blow the fire sign at seven o'clock. And if you were under 16, unless you were your parents, you had to be off the school. I mean, off the streets. So we would kind of get out there and uh, mess around. And Cat Funk and Earl Hughes and those guys would chase us. 
They never could catch anybody, but <laughs> anyway, that's what uh, originated uh, the fire siren, and that went on for years, by gosh. Yeah, I, rem I remember that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a good story, Bob. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you asked a good question, Uncle John. Gordon <laughs> Join the meeting. Gordon, we hear you now. <laughs> Hello, uh, I, I just have to uh, say to everyone um, how diligently Gordon <laughs> has been trying to join this whole time. So we've got him by audio now. I think, it, I think, it's, uh, I think it's Revenge of the Machines or something. Hmm. Is Gordon on there? Yeah, so let me, let me tell you then, Gordon. So, so we've, got, uh, we've got Vic. We've got Bob Mason, Bob Roberts, John Della, and Tim Ead. So this is why, why, is it, why is it that the two preacher's sons are the only ones on telephone? That's right. Why? <laughs> John, that's a good question. We, we'll get caught up eventually. Well, well, I will be able to. The next time around, I think I'll be able to uh, do this uh, on with a, you know, with a picture because I'm learning a lot more about this than I realized. So, because I haven't really had to use a picture before, so I don't know. If you want to look at me anyway, but would uh, you ask? Uh, always... Gordon, would you ask Gordon if his sister-in-law that was married? To his brother who was, was still living. She was a coming in girl that she was in my class in school. And I don't know whether she's still living or not. Uh, Bob, she is still living. She's uh, living with her younger son right now because she's uh, having some difficulties. She falls sometimes, but uh, uh, she uh, she's doing fairly well except for uh, some fall risk. And uh, uh, and her younger son Mark, where she lives, has uh, Parkinson's, so they both have some difficulties. Well, they uh, Bradshaw was in my class too, and uh, he was down here a couple of weeks ago, and I missed him. But his younger brother died. Oh, uh, really? He he had oh, lived was... in Evansville for a long while. But that's Albert Bradshaw you're talking about, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. that's right. And I have a question for the group. How many remember the little poem that uh, Alf Turley used to recite? They like the blows of root and toot and toot. I ever should feel the steam that blows the whistle will never turn the wheel. That's it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it takes a ton of cold water to make that engine go. It only takes a thimble full to make the whistle blow. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Say that when he come in a beer joint, and Alf would say, beer, beer, beer for those boys. <laughs> the, the story goes that Alf Turley was, was obviously drinking and called his wife from the Green Lantern and said, uh, uh, what are we having for supper? And she said... Uh, uh, he said, what are we having for supper? And she said, bullshit. He said, well, just fix half of it. I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's supposed to be a true story. That story. I thought, I thought Turley Willem said that. Yeah, he did, Turley. He's, he's got the wrong Turley. The, I got the, Turley okay, Willems. Well, it was Turley Willems. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> They, uh, Alf did write the, the uh, proverbs and stuff. Yes, they passed out little cards that had those names on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he put it in a book, and uh, it was published. It had I don't know seven or eight hundred pages in it. And said his rank to how they judged the poems and stuff, and I think his was on page five hundred and something. <laughs> Bob, is Santa Luz still okay? Bob? 
Is Sandra Lou still okay? Bob, uh, uh, Sandra Lou, well, I saw her in January. She was she was at my brother Mark's funeral, so she was doing okay. But I have I saw her at your brother. I saw her at your brother Bob's funeral. I hadn't seen her since high school. Yeah. And uh, just wondered about her. Still in Canada. Is this Sandra Lou uh, Roberts? Yes. Yes. Oh. Did you all finish uh, with the town marshals? Does anybody remember Laymaster? Albert Laymaster. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got him. Yeah. He well, was a I, quiet one. I didn't hear the discussion about uh, town marshal. Did you come up with a lot of names? Several. I, th I, think, his, I think his dad was marshal. Uh, Bob Harmon. Who's that? What about the name Seed Bowman? You remember him? Yeah, that's who I was talking about. Yeah, we his name was that. Shelby. Shelby okay. Bowman. His nickname was Seed. Yeah. Yeah. Now Hank Hank Bowman. I think Jim was, Jim Laymaster was uh, Marshall. Yeah. yeah. Bob Harmon was. Was that Jim? Yeah. Yes. Mark Dooley was my favorite. Yeah. yeah, Mark Dooley. I think he. everybody liked Mark. <laughs> yeah. Mark would say, I'm going to run some of you boys up on the hill. Well, he didn't have a car. <laughs> we always wondered how he'd get us up to the jailhouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say my, my Uncle John is an honest one because after we got off this Zoom last month, the next weekly family Zoom, I mentioned that we were going to, when we met next on our monthly, come up with the town marshals. And so I, I suggested that we kind of pull the audience of our uh, extended family members. But Uncle John was honest and just uh, contributed what he came up with on his own. Okay. I thought that was the only fair way to do it. Well, your, your younger, uh, much younger brother, uh, Mike, is avoiding altogether, probably because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want to lose out on uh, the number of town marshals. But uh, Gordon, Bob Roberts, really ran, uh, ran everybody, because I think he, he named, a, I don't know, three or four dozen of them. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy for this every month. We appreciate it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'm just looking here. Um, it's actually Mother's Day on Sunday, May the 9th. That's the next uh, second Sunday. So uh, put put that in your calendars. Um, I. I thought I would show, well, actually, let me ask Uncle John, was there something in particular from your smug mug you wanted me to, to show? Or oh, did just, we? Just about, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but if you, if you fumble through it, there's a lot of old English pictures. There. Yeah, so that that's something that uh, that folks can, can look at. And um, we had also <clears throat> looked during last hour's family Zoom at the current issue of Southern Indiana Living Magazine. It has uh, 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 an article in it that's got a photo from Uncle John Smug Mug uh, about Old English. Okay. I thought I thought I was gonna pull that up here, but I I got rid of it. So. And by and by the way, uh, my my daughter was going through. YouTube a few minutes ago, and there are there were she she logged in English Indiana, and there were many many different videos of English Indiana on YouTube. And, and Bob Roberts, one of them was uh, 
field burning. I don't know what that was all about, but I, she was flipping through them. Several for field burning. So if you go to YouTube and enter English Indiana, there looks like seven or eight videos of English Indiana. Hmm. Yeah, I'll um here. I, I'm going to share my screen. Um, the folks on the phone aren't going to benefit much from that, but um, let me just give me a second here. I'm going to share my screen and show first the uh, historical society's uh, YouTube page here because it's got um, or or their uh, YouTube YouTube channel I should call it. Um, no, it's not letting me share my screen. Um, but that that I think uh, is largely what Vic is mentioning, um, and that's where these monthly videos are. And uh, I don't know why I can't show it to you, but um, I was also going to show you that Southern Indiana Living magazine. But I'm failing here. So Gordon, you're not the only one who's uh, who's challenged with technology this month. Because their phone connections and it's not showing that those are phone connections. Oh, per perhaps. Perhaps that is it. Um, let's see. I'm going to try one last time. Ah, I just stopped oh, and started yeah. over again. So, oh. so yeah, here, see all, all of these thumbnails here <laughs> are of you guys. And um, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of neat stuff up on here so it's it's crawford county in history that's the the channel on youtube and um that that's the historical society's channel and then uh let's see here if i can pull up pull up well this is the smug mug. I already had that up on there. So that's something worth looking through, but it's jmflanagan.smugmug.com. And then Southern Indiana Living Magazine is going to come up here. Share screen, and it's this one. So this is the March-April issue. And on page seven, I believe it was. Yes, this is a forgotten Main Street, English, Indiana, 1953. And this is the photo courtesy of John Flanagan. So for, for the folks on the phone, Uncle John, what <clears throat> what are we looking at in this photo? Well, we're standing right in front of the printing office looking north up Main Street. Uh, yeah, you see, you see Griner's Griner sign there, the jewelry store. Griner's yeah. jewelry store sign. And the English theater sign over on the other side of the street. All that unique roofing that protected everybody from the sun and the rain. Absolutely. In front of each store. That was, I thought that was a real good, I don't know why towns didn't keep doing that. That was a very handy idea. Yes, it was. But it was, they were, it was expensive to maintain them, wasn't it? Well, I expect it was, but it would draw more business, wouldn't it? Yeah, I... They seem like as though they were constantly having trouble with them, you know. I don't remember any work maintaining those. I don't remember ever seeing anybody doing anything for that. I remember over there on the in front of Leo Land's store and the and that the kind of limestone block bucket building was where the bats lived in the evening while the bats would all come out of that. But during the day, when you walk down there, you can hear them squeaking. Uh, 
there. You remember that storage building they had next to the printing office that uh, used to be Claude Duggins's meat market? Oh yeah, yeah. Before that, it was it was a band a bandstand that was built yeah. for for Miss Blake's uh, right across theater. from the theater. And, and they'd they'd come down and make a public concert what every week or every every so often. That was a great that was a great idea. Yeah. What did you say it was built for, Uncle John? The bandstand. Yeah, yeah bandstand. It was, it was built for Miss Miss Blake was the band instructor at the high school. Uh, and they built that for I I assume they built it for her. I, that's the first memory yeah. I have of it. She would she would take the band. She won she won everything in her class in the state. Right. Right. And they'd come back in English and they would march and play it at maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night when they would come back. From the They'd stop outside the city limits and, and get out of the bus and get all their instruments and march into the town. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was cool. They didn't have basketball or anything back then. And so uh, the kids all played in the band and she had, she had a dandy. Well, you pretty much had to play in the band if you were going to be in the school because she wouldn't let you get away with not doing it. I remember one time that I think there were 92 kids in high school and she had something like seven in band. <laughs> yeah. She was a go-getter. Well, all right, folks, we're, we're at the hour here. So uh, unless there's a burning desire, I guess, uh, We'll say farewell until next month. Hey. Jeremy, Jeremy, could I could I say one thing, Jeremy? Please, Gordon, you've got the floor. I, I don't I don't know if uh, if anyone has uh, heard this, but I just saw the obituary of Carolyn Lane, Marcus Lane's daughter. Yes, right. We we've got that. Yeah, we okay, talked I about that. Yeah. Okay, good. You didn't didn't know if you were aware of it. Thank you for that. Okay. So welcome to Tim. Hope you're back again next next month. Well, Hi, thank you so much. And I I am just I just you guys sharing your stories and everything from so long ago. To me, it sounds long ago, although I know it hasn't been. I, it's been inspiring, and I've really appreciated uh, listening to these uh, uh, things. And when uh, you know, I, I was. When Jeremy said, you know, why don't you just join us? Why, you know, I was thrilled to death. So just because, like I said, I don't know all of you, but what you have said and has really been inspiring to me. So I hope you will. Uh, uh, and thank you for the invite to join you again. I would love to do that. All right. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Well, glad thank you, Jeremy. Thank, 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 thank Thanks, you Jeremy. all. Thank you all. All right. Take care till next month. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.